Let's get started. Um, welcome to the second lecture on um, reinforcement learning. This one's about exploration and exploitation. And I'll go into depth um, about what I mean when I say those words. I said some, something about that last lecture. Um, in terms of logistics, just to make you aware, um, just because of scheduling reasons, we'll have a couple of reinforcement learning lectures now in fairly close proximity. So next Tuesday there will be another reinforcement learning lecture and then Thursday again. So we'll have a little bit of a sprint, you could say, um, on the reinforcement learning side of this, uh, this course. And then there will be a couple of deep learning lectures in a row. So I'm not sure whether that's more helpful or less helpful for you to grasp the material. Maybe it actually works quite well. Um, but I just wanted to make you aware. Also, the um, um, so somebody noted last time that the deep learning assignment wasn't out yet. So this was indeed a mistake on our, on our end. So we also extended the deadline for that um, and put it out. The reinforcement learning assignment will also um, the first reinforcement learning assignment will come out in the weekend, or at the end of the weekend, basically before Monday. Um, so just to be aware of that, and it'll mostly um, be about the contents of this lecture. So if you want to pay extra attention because of the assignments, maybe this is the one you want to pay attention to. Okay. The background material, if, um, which is useful to read for this lecture, is um, Susan and Barto. Chapter two, although I will be covering some stuff that is not in that chapter, most notably on um, um, Bayesian methods, as you'll see later on in this, this lecture. Um, but a lot of material he gives is a lot more background. I mean, being a textbook, there's a lot more space to go into depth in some of these things. So I highly recommend reading that chapter um, fairly soon, maybe after this lecture, and you'll see where we potentially disagree. Just to recap what we talked about last lecture, this is the generic reinforcement learning setup. There is an agent who observes uh, the environment of the agents, which could be the world at large, say, or it could be some small problem that you're trying to solve, maybe a small mark of decision problem. <clears throat> but in any case, this, um, this environment um, accepts actions from the agent. The agent acts in this environment, and the environment, in some sense, responds by sending out a new observation. Or, as I said before, you could also interpret this as the agent basically pulling this observation in, if you prefer. But in any case, you get this interaction loop. And then the idea is to optimize this interaction loop. So in addition, there will be a reward signal. And then reinforcement learning is a science of how to learn to make decisions when you want to optimize this reward signal, or maybe more generally, when you want to learn about the world. When you, want, when you want to learn to say predict future observations, even if you're not optimizing anything. And we talked about what could an agent then learn. An agent could learn a policy, a value function, and or a model. In fact, we'll bump into each of these again in this lecture. Um, and the general problem involves taking into account time and consequences. So especially this last bit is important because your actions might not just um, change your immediate reward, but they might also change in some sense the world which means that then later decisions are affected because something has changed now. It could be as simple as you moving somewhere means that the next state you're there rather than here, which is a simple change in the environment. It could also be that you change something structurally in the environment so that if later you come back to a certain situation, it is now different than it was before. So th these decisions in general can affect the reward. The agent state, the internal state of the agent, which includes, for instance, its memory, and the state of the environment. However, in this lecture, we're going to simplify things because in their simpler setting, we can already meaningfully talk about exploration and exploitation, how to make these decisions. So what we're going to do is we're going to take away the sequential structure, which means that past actions will now no longer influence the future state of the environment. Essentially, you'll have um, the opportunity to interact with a problem again and again without changing the problem. Formally, what we'll have is we'll have a distribution of rewards where this distribution will be identical for a given action across, across time. So you'll basically be able to query, you, you can output an action, you'll get a reward back, you'll be able to query the system again and again and again without changing that reward distribution. That's different from the general case, and it's uh, definitely a simplification, but it turns out that the problem that results from this is still rich enough to talk about many things. And in fact, the simplification also makes it possible to talk about um, some things that are harder to do in the full case, 
For instance, we can talk about how to optimally solve the decision-making problem. So this is a simple example of that. Just consider there's a rat, and this rat has access to two levers, a black one and a white one. I realize now I was a little bit ambiguous in, in this lecture. When I say a black lever, I think I always mean the one with the black background, rather than the lever itself being black. <laughs> um, I'll get back to that whenever I actually call them a certain color, just to make sure that we're, uh, we're on the same page. Um, so on Monday, this rat pulls the black lever and gets a shock. Okay, so maybe that's a bad lever, maybe you just don't want to do that. On Tuesday, it pulls the other lever, and let's just assume there's just these two. So on Tuesday, it pulls the white lever, the one with the white background, and some, some latch opens and a piece of cheese falls out. So the rat's happy. So then, on Wednesday, again, the rat is given this choice. You can pull either of these levers. So what are you going to do? Does anybody have a suggestion for what the rat should do? Yes, I would also pull the white one if I were the rat. But let's assume that the rat does pull the white one, but now it gets a shock. So then the question is, okay, what should you do next? Now, maybe in this case you have a strong intuition for what the rat should do. Maybe some of you even disagree on what, it, what the rat should do. Uh, maybe we could have a very quick poll. Could you raise your hand if you would pull the, the lever with the black background? Okay, there's a small minority. Of course, some people might just not raise their hand on either of these choices. Um, Okay, we'll get back to this example in depth later. Just keep it in mind. Um, so the trade-off between exploration and exploitation is essentially the trade-off between uh, maximizing performance, this is what we call exploitation, and increasing your knowledge about the problem, which we call exploration. So this is a fundamental uh, problem in online decision making because you're actively collecting your data as I talked about in the last lecture. This is different from getting a data set which you don't, uh, you have no means of changing anymore. Now we do, we, we basically sample. This is very related to a research field uh, called active learning, if you know about that, where you're also in charge of collecting the samples. Um, but that's basically what I'm going to say about that. Um, these are very, just be aware that these are very related if you happen to know anything about active learning. If you don't, that's perfectly fine. Um, it also means that the best long-term strategy may involve short-term sacrifices. Sometimes you want to try, try something that you think is not such a good idea. You might not be completely sure. You think it's probably a bad idea, but you're going to try it anyway just to see. Or the alternative version of this, which is similar but maybe feels a little bit different. Sometimes you might not pick the thing you think is optimal just to try something else, even if you don't necessarily think that something else is bad. So the main difference here is whether you think that the thing is bad that you're trying or not. But in reinforcement learning, this basically just means whether your rewards are high or low, it doesn't really matter. You're going to pick something which has the highest reward you think right now, or something that has a little bit of a low reward. And sometimes it makes sense to pick something that has a little bit of a low reward, at least according to your current estimates, simply because you're not sure. And it might be that you're wrong, and therefore you want to learn more about the world. So that means we want to gather enough information to, in the end, make the best overall decisions. And we'll formalize what that means later. So the setting, to start with that, is often called the multi-armed bandit setting. And this is in an analogy to the one-armed bandit, if you happen to know that um, phrase. If you don't, it means uh, it's basically a, a different way to talk about slot machines in a casino. If you have a slot machine, there's a lever that you pull and then you either get some money or you don't. Uh, this is sometimes called a one-armed ba one bandit, because in the end, in the long run, it steals your money. And then the multi-armed bandit, you can basically think of as a long, long row of these slot machines, where there's each decision now corresponds to one of these machines, and they may have different payoffs. And in addition, just to maybe be aware that we don't take the analogy too far, in this case, some of these slot machines might actually be a good idea, so you don't necessarily uh, lose money by playing, uh, playing these. It's just an analogy. Uh, but it's one that's very sticky, so multi-armed bandit is a very common phrase for these problems. And formally, we just have a set of known actions. It's just a discrete set at first. Um, there are extensions in the literature to continuous sets where this is a real value, but we are just going to consi consider a discrete set. So there's just a limited set of these things you can, you can consider, a limited set of actions. Uh, 
And whenever you try one of these actions, and you can only try one on each time step, you'll get a certain reward. The reward here is assumed to be random. So there's a distribution. And what we're going to assume about this distribution in this case is that it's fixed but unknown. So the fixed uh, property of this distribution is basically what I meant when I said before we're going to get rid of sequential structure. The distribution of the rewards will not be affected by your past action, it's only affected by your current action. So whatever you did in the past, it doesn't matter. If you're going to pick this action, you'll get a certain reward with a certain probability. And now we're going to formalize the goal as maximizing the cumulative reward. But there's something that's importantly different from the previous lecture, because in the previous lecture, we talked about optimizing cumulative reward into the future. But right now, we're actually talking about not just within an episode, but across the agent's lifetime. We want to accumulate all of the rewards, and we basically want to maximize that cumulative sum. What that means is that we're basically not going to give too much allowance for learning. Essentially, we want to, the learning to be in some sense optimal, that we don't want to lose too much in the beginning while we're learning to do better at the end. In fact, we're going to just fold all of these things into one and we're going to say, you want to basically do as best as you can across your lifetime, including the part where you're learning. In fact, we might assume that you'll learn the whole time. You never really stop learning. So this is a little bit different from your typical train test split, where you allow at train time to do anything basically. You don't care what your loss is at train time, but at test time, that's when it matters. This is a little bit different where basically you're tested the whole time during training. This is the common way to analyze these bandit um, settings. Um, and therefore we're going to stick to that here. You could, of course, also imagine a different version where you have some, a lot of time in which you can train, and then you're tested, but we're not going to consider that in this lecture. So um, for those of you who are familiar with game theory uh, terminology, sometimes this is called a game against nature, because you're basically playing against the environment in some sense. Except the environment is indifferent, so it'll just return the same distribution. Won't try to um, fool you or take advantage of you. Okay, so this is the setting. And now we can talk about, um, as we did before, about what the values of a certain action. So in this case, this is simply something that is dependent on the action. There's no state. You're always basically in the same state. That's, the, that's another way to think about it. And then the true value of an action is just defined as the expected reward for taking that action. Now, of course, we can estimate this simply by taking the average. Whenever you pick an action, you just average that reward in and then this will give you an estimate, which is in, in some sense a pretty good one, for the expected reward. So I wrote that down down there using indicator functions. Uh, the summations are over the whole of time that you've uh, seen so far, but you will not have taken this same action on, on every time step. So there's an indicator function there that basically says, I'm only counting the steps on which I selected this specific action. It's just a little bit of a notation. And then, um, we're dividing by the total number of times you've selected that action, and we're only counting the rewards for that action. So it's a simple average, but the notation maybe is a little bit uh, verbose. We could also, um, of course, compute this online, basically storing the previous average and then just moving, whenever you see a new reward, you just move your average a little bit towards the new reward. And if you do this with the step size down there, where n now is the number of times you selected that action. This will give you exactly the same result as before. It will be the exact average of the rewards you've seen for this action. The values, the estimates, this capital Q here, subscripted by T, is no longer the true value. It's, the, it's your estimate at time T, just to be aware. So the true value is this small Q, which has no subscript of T, and then the big Q with the subscript T is our estimate. Now this formulation, I, um, I wanted to point out also because we'll see it much more often and it's a common way to write down more general update functions. And one simple generalization that you could already consider here is you, should, you could consider a different step size. For instance, you could consider a constant step size, in which case you won't have a flat average of all the things you've seen so far, but the average will, it will be a weighted average with more weight to the recent things. And this can be useful, for instance, if the uh, assumption that your reward distribution is fixed is not true. 
if it slowly changes over time, it might be much better to track rather than to get the flat average. Um, also, this turns out to be much more useful when you do function approximation because then you can't really average things. You have to just make small snaps towards things as in the typical, when you do something uh, with deep neural networks, we typically have a step size there, but we don't typically average. We just have a step size that moves you a little bit towards uh, whatever the answer is right now. So again, this is just a little bit of notation that we'll bump into more often in the course. Um, and then we can apply that, for instance, to this example. So let's formalize the problem here by saying cheese is a reward of plus one, getting a shock is a reward of minus one, and then optimizing the cumulative reward basically means you want to get cheese as often as you can, you don't want to get shocked. And in this case, then, the, the action values after the experiences there on the left would be that the um, value of the white lever, with which I mean the lever with the white background, sorry for the ambig ambiguity, would be zero here because we had a plus one once and we had a minus one once. And for the uh, lever with the black background, it would be minus one because we've only ha ever had a one uh, minus one in this case. So, <laughs> We're going to make it a little bit worse. So it made sense so far to select the leaf with the white background again, because it's the only one that ever gave cheese. But what happens if you select it over and over again? And it turns out it shocks you, like every time. So now the, the, the rat has pulled it four times in a row, and each time it got the minus one. What should the rat do? What should it do the next time step? Anybody have a suggestion? Switch? So it makes sense, it makes sense at some point to switch. However, if you just look at the estimated action values, the estimate for the, the lever with the black background is still at minus one. Because the only data you've ever seen for that lever is a minus one. So if you just look at your estimates and you would uh, use a greedy algorithm, it would continue to select that lever with the white background. So that obviously feels a little bit wrong. At some point, we have an intuition that you should switch again, but how do you formalize that? Why should you switch? And that's what we'll talk about basically the rest of the lecture. Um, and can we also devise an algorithm that optimally switches between these things? So how can we reason about this trade-off between the exploration and the exploitation? It seems natural to somewhat take into account that the estimates can be uncertain. In the example before, the lever with the black background had an estimated value of minus one, which is more or less the best estimate we could get from the data we've seen for it, because we've only ever seen a reward of minus one. But we also only have ever seen one sample of that. So we must be a little bit uncertain about that value in some sense. Can we take that into account? And can we reason about that formally? And maybe can we even trade off the exploration and the exploitation optimally? So in order to reason about this, I'm going to introduce a little bit of extra terminology, also because this is very common in the literature when talking about bandits. And to do that first, we just define the optimal value. In this case, V star is not a function of anything. Normally it would be a function of state, but there's only one state, so it's just a number, which is the uh, value, the actual maximum true action value. So if you would know the true action values, you would just pick the maximum of those, that's your optimal value for the problem. It's the highest value you can, you can get on average. Highest expected reward. Now we're going to introduce a new term which is called regret, which is the opportunity loss for each step. So Q of a t here, that's the actual value, Q. So this is the true value of the action you selected at a t. So if this is the optimal action, this thing will be zero. If you have selected an action that is not actually optimal, this thing will always be positive. It cannot be negative because of the definition of the optimal value. So to give an intuitive example, in hindsight you might regret taking a tube rather than cycling, say because there were many delays. Um, but maybe you would have regretted taking the bus even more because maybe it was completely gridlocked. Um, but you might only notice after the fact, so you might sample and maybe each day you could in, uh, interpret as an independent sample of this. 
So maybe sometimes you try one, sometimes you try the other. It's a little bit noisy. You don't exactly know which one. Um, but over time, you learn actually cycling gets me there the fastest, basically on average, even if it's not always exactly the same. Um, maybe the other ones are much more noisy as well. So an obvious problem with this formulation, or it's not really a problem, it's just a property, is that the agent cannot observe or even sample the real regret. But, so why are we introducing it then? It turns out to be useful to analyze learning algorithms. We could look at an algorithm that basically trades off the exploration and the exploitation in a certain way, and then we can reason about what is the regret that this algorithm incurs, and then we can reason about how does this regret grow over time. So the goal, now it becomes the trade of exploration and exploitation by minimizing the total regret. Now note that this is exactly the same goal as I've specified before, which was to maximize the cumulative reward across the agent's lifetime. Um, but the benefit of this is that we are able to talk about this thing, we know that the optimal value of it would be zero. We also know that zero is not actually attainable because that would mean you know the optimal action and you never select a different one. But we know that there's like uh, an optimal solution here which is zero, which you wouldn't know for the maximum cumulative rewards. You don't know what the optimal solution is there. And we also know we want to minimize this thing. So we, the, the bigger it grows, the faster it grows, the worse it is. And turns out that's useful um, to reason about. Again, note, um, I'll get to that. Um, again, note that the sum extends beyond, sing beyond episodes, so it covers basically the whole lifetime of the agent. It's about the whole learning process of the agent. So it factors in both the learning and the exploitation, essentially. So you want to do good while you're learning, essentially. Yeah? Um, the question was, so, when, so to compute the regret, we need to know the optimal value, right? So then we yeah. actually know the, the bound of our trajectory kind of well. Yes, so the assumption here is not that you can use this in your algorithm directly. Sure. Uh, the assumption is just that we use this in the analysis, so the agent never knows the optimal value, uh, essentially. So the motivation was that we know like, that it's zero is the best? Yes, but the agent doesn't. We, we know this when we analyze the algorithm, yeah. but the agent has no idea what the, what the optimal yeah, how's, value is. How is it better than just the um, sum of rewards we had before? Because if, if we need to use that to compute this, then we yeah. know the best. It's just, a, it's just a convenience thing. Um, um, I'll, I'll get to this, but I'll, I'll answer right now. Um, the, consider these two cases. So in one case, all of your rewards are um, zero or positive, which means that your total cumulative reward will basically grow unbounded, but you don't know where. The other case is where maybe the maximum reward is zero and the other ones are negative, which means that at some point maybe your total reward will stop growing and will become stationary because you've done all the, the bad things you've ever tried and now you know to select this action that actually has a zero reward. So these things, these functions, these sums of total rewards, they might grow indefinitely or at some point they might saturate and stop growing as much. But for the regrets, it turns out we can actually talk about algorithms in the sense of the regret growing linearly with time or, and this turns out to be the better case, they grow sublinearly over time, which means that they will, they will still grow because you'll still continue to select actions that, you, uh, that might not be optimal to explore, but they will grow much, much slower than if you would just pick the wrong action every step. And this distinction between linear and sublinear is harder to make in the cumulative reward case than it is for the regret case. So it's just for the analysis to be able to talk about the properties of these things, but they're kind of equivalents, right? We're just, we've just introduced a little bit of uh, terminology to make it more convenient to talk about later. Yes? Um, about the optimal reward, like, could we still estimate what the agent's estimate of the optimal value might be based on the range of rewards that Yes, so, um, on a related note, algorithms I'll talk about uh, later in this lecture would, for instance, um, keep into account a complete uncertainty about what you believe the expected reward could be for the agent. And you can reason about how this evolves over time. Um, I'll get back to that. So if your question remains after I talk about it, please uh, ask it again, because it's a good question, but um, hopefully we'll answer. <laughs> 
Again, always feel free to stop me whenever you want. If anything's unclear, it's probably unclear for more people than just yourself. So I was probably unclear if something is unclear. So please uh, help me clarify. OK, so the regrets can, in principle, grow unbounded. Um, but it's more interesting how fast it grows, as I just said. And to give an example, the greedy policy has linear regret. This means that in expectation, the regret grows as a function that is linear in the number of steps that you've taken. To make that more concrete, consider the example again. Suppose that the actual probability of getting a cheese when you pick the leaf with a white background is 0.1. So there's only a 10% chance that you get the cheese. The rat just happened to, to have a lucky episode essentially on the second time step over there. And also let's assume that the probability of getting the cheese when you pull the lever with the back background was actually 0.9. So the rat was particularly unlucky there on the first uh, time step. This could happen, right? <clears throat> now, the optimal value will be the expected reward when you pull the lever with the black background, which in this case is 0.8. It's 0.8 because it's plus one uh, with probability 90%, minus one with probability of 10%, so in total the expected reward will be 0.8. And because I completely inverted the probabilities for the uh, leaf with the back back, uh, uh, white background, that one actually has a true value of minus 0.8. So in this case, the rat was very unlucky with its first two uh, um, episodes. And the, um, the value estimates are essentially quite wrong. Now the value estimate for the leaf with the white background will continue to become better and better um, as it observes it more and more. But as I noted before, it will the rat would actually never go back to pulling the leaf with the black background because we've estimated that now as minus one. And because we've seen the cheese at least once for the leaf with the white background, the estimated reward there will ne never actually reach minus one. So if you're greedy, you'll just continue to select this leaf with a black, white black background, even though in this case, it's actually the suboptimal thing to do. So the regret that the, this rat incurs turns out to be 1.6 uh, times t, which is the difference between the optimal thing and the thing you're actually selecting, um, which indeed grows linear as a function of the time. Um, now this specific value is conditioned on these first two episodes being exactly what they are. So the rat is conditioned on the rat being a little bit unlucky in these first two episodes. In general, you can reason about this in expectation. So there's a non-zero probability that this happens. So there's a non-zero probability that your uh, regret goes linearly um, with the time. In some cases, the rat will be lucky and the greedy action will actually lock into the actual optimal action. So in some cases, the regret won't grow. But because it sometimes can grow with a non-zero probability, the, re the, ex the expected total regret still grows linearly. Is that clear? Okay. Now we can talk about the regrets in yet a little bit a different way, which turns out to be useful by looking at what is, the, like, what is the action regret. And the action regret is defined as just what is your regret, so the expected uh, uh, regrets when you take that action. And we'll introduce a delta notation for this. So this delta A is basically, it's the action regret or the gap between the true value of that action and the optimal value. This delta is zero for the optimal action and it will be positive for any action that is not optimal. Now we could, uh, using this notation, we can rewrite the total regret over time. So note that the first sum there on the left is overall time steps. So we basically consider all of the actions that you've ever selected and we look at the um, true value of that action and we compare it to the optimal value and we just add to the regret whenever uh, you select uh, the action, we, we add that, uh, the corresponding gap. And we can rewrite this as a sum over actions by taking into account uh, how often you selected an action. This is quite clearly true. You just take each action, you get the number of times it has been selected up to time t, and you just count the gaps that way. So this second sum is uh, over typically much smaller set. It's just over the actions rather than over time. But these are completely equivalent. And then we can just write it down 
um, just using the notation defined up there, this is just basically plugging, plugging in the definition of what that gap is, we can basically say our total regret can now be written as a sum over actions, where we basically just say the number of times you select an action times what the regret will be for that action. That's probably quite intuitive, but it's good to be sure you're, you're following. Um, but this allows us to reason about it intuitively as well. So what would a good algorithm do? It would ensure small counts for any action that has a high gap, a high regret. If an action has a particularly low gap, a low delta, so it's pretty close to the optimal action or it's even optimal, then you don't particularly care that this number of times you've selected it is small. It can be fairly large, especially for the optimal one, you essentially want that to be large because then your total regret would be uh, smaller. And this turns out to be useful in the analysis as well because then you can reason about, okay, we want one of these two to be small at least. Both small is always good, but if say, the gap is very big, then we definitely want n to be small. And then the question is, can we, can we ensure that somehow? So again, the actual regrets are not actually known, so this is more for the analysis of the algorithm. But first we consider a much simpler, uh, simpler case, something we also considered in the first lecture. We could do something, just add a little bit of randomness. We could add a little bit of randomness to the policy essentially by picking a random action, uniformly random across all of the actions, uh, on each time step with a certain probability. Now this is actually maybe the most common exploration strategy in uh, current day reinforcement learning, also in big applications. For instance, this, is, uh, this was used for the results of the Atari games for the DQN algorithm. And it turns out to be quite effective, even if it's maybe not the most um, sophisticated exploration method. The way it works is very simil, uh, simple. We call this epsilon greedy, and it basically means you select the greedy action with one minus epsilon, and with probability epsilon, you select a random action. The random action can also include the optimal action, so essentially the, the sorry, the greedy action. So essentially the probability of selecting the greedy action is slightly higher than one minus epsilon, because you also have to factor in that you can select it when you select randomly. Now the question is, is this enough? And how do we pick the epsilon? So we already mentioned that the greedy policy can lock into a suboptimal action forever. And we showed this in the example with the rat. Now it turns out the epsilon greedy algorithm, it continues to explore if you have a fixed epsilon, which essentially means it will always eventually find out everything there is to know about all the actions. All of your action values will become accurate in the long run, which is good. So it'll notice at some point it will basically learn which action value is truly higher than the other ones. However, if your epsilon is, true, is, is, is really constant, this also means you have a linear expected regret, simply because there's this probability, and it continues to be the same probability in this setting, that you'll select suboptimal actions. So again, the total regret here grows linearly, similar to how it did in the greedy case doesn't mean these algorithms are in some sense the same or equally good or bad. I would definitely say this is better than greedy in the typical case because you do learn, um, eventually you'll basically select the optimal action with probability one minus epsilon, which is not guaranteed for the greedy case. But the regret still grows linearly, so you still lose something. And it seems at some point unnecessary. If you really know the true values of all the actions because you've selected all of them so many times, do you really need to continue to explore? Do you really need to try that action that you're pretty certain is not good? The answer is no, you don't have to, and you can do better. So, sometime, a couple of decades ago, people were investigating this problem, and they were reasoning about what is the best possible thing you could hope to get. And turns out you can say something about that. And turns out it's, it's basically related to those action regrets we talked about before. It's related to the similarity, in a sense, between the optimal action and all the other actions. And then it turns out the harder problems are the ones where these actions have similar distributions, but different means. The reason being, if these distributions for the rewards are similar for different actions, it's hard to distinguish them and therefore 
it takes longer to basically find out which is the true optimal action. And you just can describe this formally um, with something that's called a KL divergence. If you don't know what it is, that's fine. Um, I think it, it was uh, in the entry quiz, but um, it's basically just a similarity between the distributions. And then uh, Lyon Robbins proved that the total regret asymptotically, so when t goes into the limit, will be larger than this quantity there at the right hand side. Now this quantity has a summation over the actions with all the action gaps in there. And it, it divides by the similarity by the distributions. I would say all of that is not that important right now. The more important bit is the log t. This basically means that the total um, expected regret that you will incur for any algorithm will grow on the order of logarithm of time. Now, this means that the regret will go un grow unbounded, which is expected because you never you're never really sure, so you maybe have to continue to explore. But it grows a whole lot slower than linear. The logarithm of, of t is a whole lot smaller for large t than t itself. So then the question is, can we find an algorithm that actually attains this bound? Can we find something that, that gets close to this? Because this is a lower bound. This doesn't say which algorithm to run. It basically sa says, for any algorithm, you will at least get this regret. So now before we get to a concrete algorithm that might attain that, let's talk about the intuition behind what you could potentially do. And I've talked already a little bit about uncertainty. Now let's assume we have some measure of uncertainty. These are three different actions, and we're fairly certain about the highly peaked one in red. We're less certain about the, the one in the middle there in blue, and we're really uncertain about the green one there at the bottom. I didn't specify how to get these uncertainties, I'll talk about that later, but just for now assume that we have these. Which action should we then pick? And the argument here is that if you're more uncertain, about the value of an action, maybe it's more important to explore that action. But maybe at first, let's zoom in a little bit, maybe at first we'll just be a little bit greedy and we'll try the action with the highest mean. Because we do think it looks quite promising and I mean there's other actions that might be optimal but this one has a good shot of being optimal as well. So we select this and let's say that we get a reward that is a little bit on the low side of what you might expect and then we might update the distribution. Not saying how, just this is just an in intuition, right? I'll just say maybe we'll update our distribution a little bit towards that. Maybe we'll shrink it a little bit. We're a little bit more certain now, the more and more samples we get, that the actual mean is there. But this means we're in a new situation now where the red, red has shifted a little bit and maybe, maybe now it looks more promising to select the green one for once. Because there is quite a bit of probability mass there on the right hand side, which means that the green action might actually be optimal, like the true value might be four or even higher for the green action. For the red action, that's very, very unlikely right now. So we'll select the green action, we'll observe something, which in this case actually is indeed higher than the mean of the green action, so maybe we're underestimating the value of the green action a little bit, and then we can shift the distribution. Now this is just to give you a little bit of an intuition of what you could do. Um, <coughs> But what we were actually doing there is being a little bit optimistic about which action might still be possible, especially in the, in the second part there where we're selecting the green action. And one way to do that is to basically uh, define an, op an expiration bonus, which we call an upper, upper confidence in this case, for each action value. And we'll do that so that the true value with a high probability is smaller than your current estimate plus that bonus. So you'll take your current estimate, you'll um, acknowledge that we're uncertain whether this estimate is correct, and we'll add a bonus so that we're pretty certain that at least the true value is below what you then get. So if your true estimate is, say, zero, you might add a bonus of, say, 10, and then basically the claim here is, okay, I don't know what the actual true value is, but I'm pretty certain it's less than 10. And then, we could have an algorithm, I'll define this bonus in a moment, but we could have an algorithm that just greedily selects among the actions, 
but using not the estimates Q itself, but the estimates plus the bonus. Now the intuition here is that this bonus should be bigger for actions that we're more uncertain about. And especially in the simple bandit case, we can do that by uh, just keeping track of the number of times an action was selected. And we can basically intuit that if we haven't selected an action often, so if this n is small, <coughs> then probably our bonus should be big. We haven't selected it often, so we want to add a big bonus so that we're pretty sure that the true value is still below that. But if we've selected an action many, 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 many times, we don't want to add a big bonus because this is, will be overly uncertain. We're not actually that uncertain about the value anymore, so a small bonus is enough. What this means then is that we'll select an action, um, even if its estimate right now is low, just because we haven't selected it often. And this is especially true if you think about if, if, there's, a, if there's an estimate at some point and an estimate of a different action which is higher, you might select that higher valued action quite, quite often, greedily. But at some point the bonus for, will shrink for that action, enough so that the bonus of the other action will over, overtake it, and you'll select the other action, just to try it out, the exploration. Now for normal flat averages, as we've discussed before, the uncertainty about where the true value is typically decreases as the square root of the number of times you selected an action. Just, this is just using the central limit theorem. And small potential caveat, this assumes that the variance of the rewards is bounded. This is typically the case, but there are distributions like the Cauchy, where the variance is actually unbounded, and in this case you basically have no hope. <laughs> but that's very rare. Um, so using this intuition, can we derive an optimal algorithm? So the algorithm idea is as follows. Recall that we want to minimize the total regret, which I've written down here as number of times you selected an action times how bad was it to selected action. That's the delta. Yes? Yes. Yes, that's a very good question. So at t equals zero, what should this upper bound be? Um, what is typically done is to say your upper bound is basically infinite for each action at t equals zero, which in practice means you're going to select all of the actions once. And only then this kicks in, because then you'll have an estimate for each of them. That's a very good question. It's also related to the assignment, because you're going to have to implement something like this. And then <laughs> Um, so rather than implementing infinities, it's better just to select each of them one time, let's say. <laughs> okay, so the idea of the algorithm will be, we want to minimize the product of how often you select an action times the, uh, the regret of that action. So if the gap is big, if this action is actually really quite bad compared to the optimal action, then we want the number of times we select it to be small. On the other hand, if the number of times we selected an action is big, we want this gap to be small. We want the algorithm to have these properties. Now, not all <coughs> n can be small because they must sum to the total time. You must select an action on every time step. So the sum of all the number of times you selected an action must grow over time. So all we can hope to do is to more often select the actions with a low gap than the actions with high gaps. Okay, so in order to reason about this, and this is what's used for the analysis of these algorithms, there's something called Huffing's inequality. Um, some of you might know this, but if you don't, this is uh, something of a more general family of results, which are called concentration um, bounds. And what it means is we can say something about how this estimate behaves without characterizing the whole distribution. And in this case, what we're going to assume is that we have some random variables. Think of these as your rewards. And we're, we're assuming they're bounded. You can also, there's different inequalities you could use when you don't assume they're bounded, but say the variance is bounded. But in this case, we're just going to assume the rewards are bounded. We know the rewards are always between, say, zero and one. Don't have to be between zero and one. You could have different bounds, and typically we have. But just for the simplicity of the theorem, we'll say between 0 and 1. And let's say we average these, as we were doing before. So our current estimate for the expected rewards is the average reward you've seen so far. 
Then it turns out we can say something, something, which is that the expected value of these random variables, these are IIDs, so we can just pick either, any one of these, the probability that that thing is bigger than the, um, the estimate you have right now, plus some bonus u, is bounded by this quantity on the right hand side. Now what does this mean? It basically means that if you've selected a number of points and you average these, if you then add a bonus to that, you can bound the probability that that thing that you got there, this mean plus u, that this thing is, is still an underestimate. And the bigger you pick u, the smaller this probability will be. If you pick a really big value, add it to your mean, right? in this case it's, it's, it's almost trivially true, the, the, the rewards are bounded, so if you add, would add one, you would be 100% sure, in some sense, that you'd uh, be overestimating. But you can bound this thing with this uh, function on the, on the left, which is now a function of the number of times you've selected, uh, you've sampled this random variable, n, and this gap. And note that it decreases for both. So the more often you select something, if you consider the same bonus, if you select it more and more often, it becomes less and less likely that you're going to be sufficiently far off. What this essentially means is we'll be fairly close within u of the actual true value after a while. If you consider a bigger gap, so if you consider a bigger um, discrepancy between your current estimate and the true value, this will also become smaller. So the higher you pick your bonus, the less likely it is that you're going to overestimate. Now the idea here is to apply this inequality, which is true for um, basically in, in general under, this, under the assumptions of the theorem, to the, to the bandit case with bounded rewards. So for instance, like I said, if you pick the rewards be between zero and one, then you can bound how far off is my estimate? So the estimate there is the big QT, and we add some bonus, which I haven't defined yet, but let's just consider some bonus. Then we can bound the probability that this whole thing is still too low. Now how do you use this then to define an algorithm? Well, let's say we want to pick a certain probability. We want to pick a probability that the true value exceeds the upper confidence bound. That's what we call this estimate plus your bonus, an upper confidence bound. So now we can basically solve, we can invert that. We had this quantity on the uh, right hand side of the previous slide in Huffington's inequality. And we just say, let's, let's pick a P and then we can solve for an upper confidence bound. And it turns out to be this quantity, the square root of the minus log P divided by two times the number of times you selected that action. Now, and this is just an intuitive idea, I'm not actually deriving the algorithm, I'm just giving you an intuition. Um, let's say we want to pick that p in such a way that it decreases over time. So what that, does that mean? We basically want the probability that we're going to, um, that we're going to be too low with our, uh, with our bound, we want that to decrease over time. For instance, as one over t. If you do that and you plug it into this bound over here, you get something down there, which is the square root of log t divided by two times the number of times you selected that action. So it turns out this two is not that important. The main things are the log, log t and the number of times you selected that action and that both of these are in the square root. Now what does this, what does this do, picking the exploration in such a way? So because the, the, the probability that we're wrong, essentially, that our estimate plus bound is still an underestimate of the true value, it decreases over time. Um, but it doesn't actually go to zero. And this means that we'll continue to explore indefinitely, but eventually we will we'll almost lock into the, the optimal action. We'll select it more and more often as time goes by because our estimates get more and more accurate. And we're more and more certain that the, the estimates are very close to the true value. Um, so this leads to a concrete algorithm where we've now defined this bonus. And like I said, 
The two there wasn't too important, and I basically pulled it out and I made it into a parameter, C. So this is a bonus that we're adding to our estimates. We have an estimate Q, and we're going to add something that is the square root of the log of T, your time step, divided by the number of times you selected this specific action. So the quantity above the bar doesn't depend on action, this will just grow, but slowly, logarithmically, over time. So what does this mean in practice? It means that for this action, let's consider an action that you haven't selected in a long, long while. This means that this bonus will keep on growing because of the log t. And if you never select it for, for a very long time, this bonus will grow and grow and grow until it goes higher than all of the other estimate plus bonuses for all the other actions. At that point, you'll select it. When you select it, the number of times you selected this action will go up, which means the bonus drops. Now, at the same time, you've got a new sample, so your Q, your estimate for this, uh, val for this action will also change. It might go up, might go down. Maybe you were underestimating the value of this action and maybe this value goes up, so maybe it actually becomes more likely that you'll select this action again in the future. Or maybe your estimate was pretty accurate and you get a reward which is very much in line with the estimate you already had, in which case it doesn't change much and then the bound, the bound which has gone up slowly with the logarithm and then gone down when you selected it, basically will ensure that it again takes quite a long time before you select it again. So what the log t essentially does, it, is, it, it bubbles up all of the action probabilities. Each of these actions basically uh, will get selected indefinitely again because this bound keeps on growing. But whenever you select it, you kind of whack it back down again. And then only if your actual estimate is high, will you continue to select this action. This is an important property. So essentially, when will you select an action? Either when you're uncertain, n is small relative to the other actions, or the, the estimated value is high. And this is a general property. We basically want to select the actions that we know are good with pretty high probability or that we're very uncertain about. And this algorithm has exactly that property. Now it turns out that you can analyze this and you can consider what this algorithm actually does. And uh, Peter Auer did this in um, 2002. And he proved a certain specific bound on the, re on the regret. Now the previous bound we discussed was a lower bound on the regret. This is an upper bound on the regret for this specific algorithm. And the upper bound, interestingly, is also of order log t. Which means that as far as the dependence on t is concerned, this is optimal. You cannot do better than log t. That's what the other bound proved. And this algorithm actually attains that. Now in practice, this c quantity can be considered a hyperparameter and it basically ties into what is the shape of your distribution? How do the distributions of the reward actually look? And sometimes it's better, to, better just to tune this a little bit and try to see if for your specific problem you can find a better value than the default value of, say, square root of 2 that uh, Peter Auer suggested. Sorry, so this is something like a confidence? Yeah, one way to think about it is that this C corresponds to do you consider like a 95% confidence or a 99% confidence? It changes over time because of the way the, uh, the bound is set up, the actual confidence. But it's related to that, yes. So, um, typical values for this are one, two, a half, around that. It's a little bit hard to intuit exactly what it means. But if you just play with it, you'll find that for certain problems, you'll get certain, uh, uh, certain values just perform better. And it's good, good to start this around, this exploration around, say, one. Yeah. Yes. Oh, so this is just, um, this is a bound, right? Sorry, in, in this setting, it's a bound. So what we're basically saying, there's a certain probability that you'll be far off. And for each action, there is such a probability. Um, this means that the probability dis distribution that we're considering, right, what, what does P mean here? It's either, is your bound an overestimate? Is your estimate plus bound, sorry. Uh, is that an overestimate of the true value? Or is it an underestimate? So there's only these two possibilities. 
And essentially what we're saying is, well, um, we want there to be a probability that the uh, true value, I mean, there's always a probability, a non-zero probability that your true value doesn't lie within your bound, right? You have a certain confidence interval in some sense. And basically these reasons about does your true value fall within that, that, that confidence interval or doesn't it? And we want that probability to have a certain property. We want that to be sufficiently, we want this bound to be sufficiently wide that we're pretty certain that, that, that the, the bonus that we're giving is meaningful in the sense that we're beyond the true value. But we also want it to be, um, we don't want to be overly uh, uncertain, more uncertain than we need to be. So we want this probability to be not too high either or too low. So there's only these two choices, whether you're below or where the actual value is below or above the estimate plus your uh, bonus. So in that sense, it's properly normalized. Yes? It doesn't actually, so what, the more general statement of Huffington's inequality basically says there's bounds A and B, and then the A and B just show up in the equation below. I just didn't put them here for simplicity. This is like the simplest statement of the, of the theorem, but it easily generalizes to other bounds, and there are similar uh, concentration inequalities for other cases, where for instance your, your, your random variables aren't bounded, but they have finite variance, and you know that the variance, for instance, is bounded, and then you can do something similar, you could get, get a similar uh, statement. But this is just the simplest, simplest one, in a sense. Yeah? Could you explain how this thing changes over time? So is this that it's an initial value? Or? Mm. So we typically don't change C over time. So what we did here is we picked a probability which we do change over time, but that may essentially turns into a constant C because the rest already changes over the time. The change over time is captured in this log T and in the N, but the C parameter, we typically just pick one and we stick with it. So you don't have to decay C. This is different from when you do say epsilon greedy. So what I mentioned is that if you have a constant epsilon, so if you have a constant random exploration throughout learning, that this is maybe not a good idea because you'll continue to select things that eventually you know are not that good, you could also consider decaying this probability over time, and people often do, but then you have to pick a decay schedule and you have to be careful how you pick that. Turns out if you do, you can actually also get logarithmic regret if you're careful on how you pick your uh, epsilon, um, but I won't cover it in this lecture. But this algorithm kind of automatically does that because of the log t and the division by the number of times you select an action. And then the c is just, uh, just regulates how quickly you learn. But essentially for any C you'll eventually get there. Um, but the constants in your, uh, in how quickly you do might change. So you might get there slower. And I'll have an example of that um, a little bit later, I think. So this algorithm is not that hard to implement. You only need the number of steps you've had so far. You need to keep a track of counts for all of the actions and you need to keep track of the average reward for all of the actions. And then, interestingly, the algorithm picks deterministically. It always, there's always one action. Let's assume that the argmax doesn't break ties randomly, but maybe it just picks the first one. Then it would deterministically pick an action on each step, which is, in some sense, deterministically the optimal choice, given all the information you have so far, for the exploration exploration trade-off. There was a question? Yeah, so the lower bound, which I showed before, that was a very general uh, statement about any algorithm that you can't do better than a logarithmic regret. I won't go into detail how they derived, but um, um, the upper bound here, essentially what you can do is you can consider this algorithm and then you can just plug that into uh, Huffington's inequality. And what you can then do is you can use that to reason about what um, how n changes over time, the number of times you select an action. And it turns out the number of times you select an action, if you use this algorithm, depends 
on how suboptimal that action is. So it depends on this action regret. And it turns out it depends in such a way that the product of these things is always at most logarithmic in t for all the actions. And this is the case either because the, the gap is very small. For instance, the optimal action has a gap of zero. So you, you, you don't mind selecting that one indefinitely often. But if the gap is very big, it turns out the number of times you select that action is relatively small. It'll only be raw logarithmic in the number of times you've selected any action at all. And this turns out to be true then for all the actions with this specific choice of a, uh, of a bound. Um, if you want to actually see the proof, which is quite, it's not actually that complex if you uh, have Huffington's inequality, you can go to that paper by uh, Peter Auer on the UCB, and he just proves exactly this thing there at the bottom using the Huffington inequality. It's a bit technical, there's a lot of steps involved, which is why, why I didn't want to put it in the slides. But um, given Huffington's inequality, it's not that hard to step through. And there's been many follow-ups to this where with different assumptions, also going back to that uh, question about why zero to one. Well, you can make many other assumptions about the distributions. And for specific assumptions, you can prove like slightly stronger things. It never goes better than log logarithmic in time, unless you make very strong assumptions about your problem. Um, but that's, that's like, this was, this was a, a landmark result because it was the first algorithm that actually achieves that bound. So, in the, um, in the previous lecture, I've talked about an agent could represent uh, internally, it could rep represent values, and then use these values to come up with actions, and then maybe this is a good way to, uh, to find good policies. Um, I also talked about maybe you can po represent these policies directly. I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, and we also talked about maybe you can learn a model. Now learning a model in general in this course we won't touch upon that much. Um, also because it's quite, it can be quite tricky to learn a true model. Uh, especially of the dynamics of the world. The way the world changed might be very hard and it might also be very hard to know um, to, to, to learn, I mean. It might also be very hard to know what to focus on. But in this case, because there's no states, basically, there's no observations, there's only these rewards, learning a model is much simpler, perhaps. So what we could do, we could have a reward model that basically predicts the reward for each action. But that looks very similar to the value-based algorithm in this case. In fact, you might these might be indistinguishable in some sense. You could interpret in this case the action value estimates as a reward model because they're basically just a prediction of what the expected reward is when you select an action. But it doesn't mean we've exhausted everything you could do with a model-based approach. And in particular, we could model more than just the expectation. We could model, for instance, the distribution of rewards. And this gives us Bayesian bandits. Now, the idea here is that you'll model a parametric distribution over the rewards. So now, there's this probability here, which is a Bayesian probability, so the way to interpret it is maybe if you want as a belief that the true expected reward is at a certain point. Sorry, I probably shouldn't have, I should have pro probably put the other one here. Um, we're going to model the, 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 where the true value is, not where the, where the rewards are. But we're going to model an expectation over, uh, sorry, we're going to model a distribution over where the true, what the true value is. And we are going to update this using the probability of the reward under your model. So now theta will represent the parameters of your parametric model. So for instance, for a Gaussian model, this could be your mean and your variance. These two parameters define a Gaussian together. For a multivariate Gaussian, these might be vectors or matrices, but for a simple, simple case, it's just a mean and a variance, just two numbers. And this will characterize a Gaussian, which could be a model for um, where you think the true value will lie. Now we can use Bayes' rule to update these, uh, these um, distributions. Basically, starting from a, from a prior P0, we could update the, the model parameters each time we see a reward for a certain action. And let's just keep these separate for each action. So each time they're conditioned on the action. So we'll basically just have a separate model for each of the actions. And we're just going to update that each time we see uh, a data point. Yes? Uh, just a quick question. So the, this should be 
Yeah, so I, yeah, we're trying to actually do, that, that's what I meant here when I said I should have put the other one. Uh, what we're actually modeling is, and it'll be in later slides as well, PQ, there on the left all the way. Basically the probability we believe the true value is somewhere. Sorry, I'll fix the... Um, using the data, we're going to update the, the probability distribution on where we think the true value is, Q, rather than RT. We're not trying to match the distribution of the reward, we're trying to learn a belief distribution over where the true value is. Um, so what does this give us? Well, one thing it gives us, it, it allows us to inject rich prior knowledge. Say that you have a Gaussian, like I said, these parameters theta might be your mean and your variance of your Gaussian. You might pick this to be in a reasonable place. You might pick the variance to be wide enough that you're pretty certain it lies within, within that distribution, but not too wide. You might pick your mean to be somewhere. Maybe the mean, the initial mean might be different for different actions. Maybe you have some prior knowledge about this. And this gives you one way to inject that. And then we can also use these distributions to do the exploration. And I'll discuss basically two different ways. One is, again, upper confidence bounds, but now using the explicit representation of these distributions. And the other one is probability matching uh, and Thompson sampling, which falls under that header. So let's consider an example to make things concrete. Let's consider a bandit with a Bernoulli reward distribution. This simply means that the rewards are either plus one or zero with an unknown probability. So the expected reward here is exactly the probability that it's one. And we want to basically model a belief over this probability. Now, for instance, we could pick a prior for each action to be uniform on zero, one, which basically means we don't have a specific preference. We believe all of these probabilities are equally likely to be true in advance. We believe each of these might happen and we don't want to pick one over the other. We're basically not saying it's a higher probability that the true, um, re, that the re, pro, pro, we're not saying that the possibility of a reward of plus one being say 0.6 is any different from it being say 0.2. Now if you have a Bernoulli uh, distribution on your random variables, um, it's natural to model these probabilities as beta distributions and then the assumption that we're going to do a uniform distribution initially is equivalent to saying we have a beta distribution with parameters one and one. If you don't know what a beta distribution is, um, it's just a probability that I'll show on the next slide, which with these two parameters that basically say how often have I seen a zero, how often have I seen a one, and confusingly uh, these things are always offset by one. So the uniform case, if you want to say the uniform case uh, basically means we have no knowledge. This has the parameters one for each. And then the way to update this posterior is, is very simple because whenever your reward is zero, you update one of these parameters. Whenever the reward is one, you update the other one. You're basically counting how often did I see a zero, how often did I see a one for this specific action. So that's a very simple update, this is nice because in general Bayesian updates can be quite involved. You might have to calculate integrals, but in this case, because we have a simple, simple uh, probability distribution, we've picked one that's particularly easy to, sit, to work with. Then we can update it very simply by just updating the parameter of the distribution in this way. Now, how does that look? Suppose we start all the way to the left there. We have no information. We make no judgment calls. We say all of these true values are equally likely. That's what the picture all the way on the left means. The y-axis here is the probability we assign, the probability mass we assign to each of the uh, true values, and then on the x-axis we have each of these true values, which spans from zero to one in this case. We know the true values between zero and one because we know the rewards are either zero or one, so the expected reward must be between zero and one, so there's no probability mass beyond zero or one, but between, in this interval we make no uh, judgments yet. Now suppose we see this sequence of rewards. We get a plus one, we get another plus one, then we get a zero, and then we get another zero. All of this is for a single action. Just considering one action, we're considering how to update this distribution. Now this is what will happen to the, to the probability distribution, which captures our belief about where the true value is. At first you get a plus one, so we see the distribution shifts to the one. 
It doesn't go all the way there. Unlike in the greedy case, we're not committing completely. We're not saying now it must be one, but we're just saying the probability that it's closer to one has grown. And the probability that it's exactly zero is very small now. It's uh, zero at exactly zero. But the probability that it's close to zero is also fairly small. If we see another reward of plus one, the distribution becomes even more skewed. Because now we have some evidence that um, it's more likely that the value is high than it is low. But it's still fairly spread out. There are still non-negible uh, probability mass, say, on the values that are below one half. Much smaller than on the values above one half right now, but there's still quite some mass. If we at that point see a reward of zero, the distribution shifts. We know no longer now the true value can be one. So basically it falls down all the way to zero there at the end. We also knew it couldn't be zero because we've seen rewards of plus, uh, we've seen rewards of zero and of plus one now. And the mean is probably somewhere in the middle, maybe a little bit still closer to one than it is to zero because we've seen more ones than zeros. But if we see another reward of zero, the distribution becomes symmetric. You can see, see there's still quite a bit of uncertainty. We don't commit yet strongly on where the actual true value will be. We just know that it's not zero, it's not one. It's quite unlikely to be very close to either one of these, but somewhere in the middle we really just don't know. And that's what's captured in this probability distribution. This is the beta distribution if you update the parameters as exactly shown on the previous slide. Now what could we then do? Let's say we have multiple distributions for different actions. One thing we could do is very similar to what we were doing before with UCB, except instead of just picking the bound, which basically defines your confidence interval, we could now just look at the distribution and define your confidence interval on that one. So for instance, a simple way to do that is you could define a, um, an upper bound which is related to the standard deviation of your distribution. That might be one way to do it, especially if you if your distributions are all Gaussians, then basically the standard deviation is enough in a sense because you don't have to capture the, the shape which might be lopsided in general. For a Gaussian it can't be lopsided, so then the standard deviation is enough. If you have a different distribution, there, there's different ways to pick out these, these values. And then maybe you can do the same thing as we did before. You pick the mean, you add a bonus which is maybe related to your uncertainty in this case on where the true value is, and you pick greedily using that. This is one algorithm that you could do. But actually more common when we model these distribution is to do something that is called probability matching. In probability matching, we're going to do something that is maybe a little bit unintuitive, or depending, some people find it very intuitive, but uh, depending on how you look at it, because we're going to select an action according to the probability that it is optimal. So what this means is that, that we're de defining a policy and we're basically going to uh, make this, pos this uh, policy equal to the probability that the true value is the maximum true value under the history here, um, where I've basically abstracted the way that this is now used, this history, to update these ba Bayesian distributions. So essentially this probability here, this is again the Bayesian probability, right? Because in truth, um, for each of the actions, it is, it is either the optimal action or it isn't, but this, probability distribution is under these Bayesian beliefs of the true, where the true values lie. And because you have all of these distributions now explicitly, you can reason about this, you can solve this. You can find the probability that this action is the optimal action under the distributions that you've uh, so far updated. Now it can be difficult in general to compute this analytically. Um, note again, by the way, that uncertain actions will have a higher probability of being maxed because there's a lot of probability mass maybe on, on the tail, so you might be more likely to select that one, which is indeed the property that we're after. Now, because it might be unwieldy, there's another thing we can do, which is called Thompson sampling, and this is actually um, from, if I say correctly, out of, uh, out of the top of my head, it's from 1933, so it's pretty old. Um, which is we're going to sample from each of these probabilities. So remember, we have these probabilities over the true values for each of the actions. We're going to sample one for each of these actions independently, and then we're just going to select greedily. 
This means that if you are very uncertain, there's a pretty big possibility that you'll select something that's really high. You're going to sample a, a, a candidate true value, essentially, that is really high. There's also a pretty big probability maybe that it's really low, so you won't select this action all the time, but you'll select it every once so often. So again, either your uncertainty must be very big for you to be selected, or your, or your current mean value must be big. That's another reason why you might be selected. And so it turns out if you do that, in expectation you're doing probability ma matching, but because you need to sele randomly select an action anyway, you can only select one action at each time step, this is completely fine. You're not, you're not losing anything by doing this in a sense. Now it turns out if you do this for say the Bernoulli bandit case that we discussed just now, this also achieves the optimal uh, lower bound on regret. So this is in a sense an optimal thing to do. Now why is this a little bit surprising? Because we're selecting these actions according to the belief we have that their true value is the optimal value. But that doesn't mean that we're taking into account explicitly how the regret changes over time, or explicitly how much we learn from picking this action. So in some sense it's a little bit surprising that this algorithm works so well. And in practice it also works quite well. But it does require you to, to uh, get these posterior distributions from somewhere, which might be a lot of overhead in complex cases, might be hard to do in general. But if you can do it, for instance for the Bernoulli bandits, there it's quite easy, and then you could use Thompson sampling, and it would be just as good as UCB, in a sense. Okay, so what does Thompson sampling, it's, like I said, it's a little bit surprising that it works well, because what does, it, does Thompson sampling not explicitly reason about? is the value of information. We could go on further, and we could reason about what the learning process is, because we know what the learning process is. We know what we're going to do. We're going to get a reward, we're going to update certain internal estimates of the agents, whether it be a model or a value, and we could reason about what we learn from each in interaction with the world. So potentially, we could reason all the way through this, taking into account the knowledge we have so far. So, this is sometimes called the, the value of information. We can reason now, we can plan through this whole tree of future potential lifetimes that you might go through. And we can maybe plan somehow optimally through this, taking into account uh, the assumptions we can make about the problem. And maybe we could quantify how useful it is to select a certain action because then we can plan through and find out how much did we learn from this action, potentially, depending on the outcome, and how would that change our later actions in terms of the learning process. So, for instance, um, if we want to quantify the value of information, it makes sense that you would gain more information when you try something that you're uncertain about. If you're already very certain, say, about a certain action value, then you basically gain no information if you select that action again. You already knew. So this is, in some sense, not the optimal thing to do. So it, according to the value of information, it might make more sense to try uncertain things more. And if we know the value of information, then we can trade off exploration and exploitation again, if we can quantify this value somehow in terms of the future expected reward. So what is the value of information? Essentially the value of information is how much can I gain later if I gather this information now. I'll try something that is uncertain, this will give me some knowledge, and I might exploit that later. And I can reason about how much I can exploit that later, how much it gains. And so, what this means is, so far we've viewed bandits as a one-step decision-making problem. Every episode lasts for exactly one step, and there's no interaction essentially between the episodes. But we could also view it as a sequential decision-making problem, by reasoning all the way across this future that might, might happen, taking into account our own learning process. So now rather than trying to plan through what the environment might do, we're planning through what might happen inside the brain of the agent, in a sense. So how do you do this then? Well, you would have to define an information state summarizing all the information accumulated so far. And then for each action, we would cause a transition to a new information state by adding certain information with probability that you can define. So if you have a probability model, if you have a model on your rewards, say, you can reason through without actually executing an action. For each action, you can say, if I would select that action, I believe it's thus and thus likely that I'll get a plus one, or a thus and thus likely that I get a minus one. And then I can reason through the resulting states 
internally in the agent, and I can reason through what the agent in both of those cases would then do. So in both of those cases, you might select a different action, depending on whether it was a plus one or a minus one, or a plus one and a zero, or a zero. In each of these cases, we can consider what the agent would do next. And again, you might select a different action then, which might again give you a plus one or a zero in either of these cases. So you get this expanding tree. In addition to the random outcome of the actions, you can reason through how likely am I to select each action, if you're using a probabilistic method. If you use UCB, the actual action selection is deterministic, but the outcomes are still random, so you would still have an expanding tree of possibilities. But if your uh, policy is also stochastic, as it would be for Thompson sampling, then in addition there's an expansion for each step which is related to how many actions there are. So this becomes a huge tree at some point, and it's very hard to reason through. But if you, might, if you, make, if you can make certain assumptions, you can reason through this whole thing. So essentially what we have here is a mark of decision process which may or may not be known. And essentially for each internal model you would have a different mark of decision process. For each internal way you select your actions you would have a different uh, mark of decision process in a sense. Um, and then you can reason through this. You can basically try to solve this thing. So now even in bandits, previous actions select, so affect the future, not because they change anything in the world, not that because they change the state of the environment, but because they change your knowledge. Now, for instance, for the Bernoulli bandit, uh, I use mu here to basically define uh, the probability. This is your mean of the Bernoulli uh, distribution, which in this case is also just your, uh, uh, your value. Then the probability of getting a zero is one minus this mu. So, for instance, you, this might be winning or losing a game with this probability. Then the information state might just be how many times uh, for each action did I get a zero? How many times did I get a one? So what we're putting in here as, as prior knowledge is essentially that we know that the rewards are zero or one. And then we can reason all the way through this. Now we can formulate this, as I said, as an infinite MDP that goes infinitely into the future where we reason about if I do this, then this might happen, and then I can reason about what happens next because then this changes my mind for the next step and so on. But you can also solve this with model-free reinforcement training. You don't have to plan through everything. You could also just sample and reason through it that way. This has been done in the past. Um, or you could use model-based reinforcement learning to reason through how these states, these information states, change over time. This becomes unwieldy because the tree can be quite big. But we'll talk about in the next lecture about things like dynamic programming techniques where you don't actually build the whole tree, but you do this step by step. And this can be more efficient. So the latter approach where you do the model-based thing is known as Bayes adaptive reinforcement learning. And of course you still need to define a prior distribution. You need to put in your prior knowledge that you have about the problem. What do you assume at the beginning about where the true values lie? And your solution will be conditioned on that. Um, but then if you pick a right prior, this can be quite, uh, quite good. In some sense optimal given your prior. But of course it can be very unwieldy. And it's unclear how to scale this, uh, especially later when we'll consider problems which are not bandit problems, where there is now also an environment state and there are observations. So this, we won't go much more in depth into this, but the, the main thing to take from this is that you can define this. You can reason through your learning process. You could, if you wanted to. Whether it's a good idea, that's more of an open question. Okay. So now I want to change gears again. And I want to talk about, we talked about values, we talked about models, now I want to talk about policies. And this will be important for several reasons. One is um, it'll show up in the assignment, which may or may not be important to you. Uh, another one is, is that this is an approach that does scale. Whereas the previous one with the reasoning through your whole learning lifetime might not scale as easily. This is something that you can apply to problems at scale and has been applied to problems at scale. Um, so what is the idea? We want to learn a policy directly. We're not going to learn a value function necessarily. We're not going to learn a model. We're just going to parameterize a policy and we're going to try to learn that. And then the question is how can you do that? So for instance, we can define a probability distribution on the actions as such. This is called a softmax or sometimes Boltzmann distribution. Uh, the lower part here is just a normalizer. 
Uh, and it basically means that your probability of selecting an action is now proportional to the uh, exponentiated preference. These h, I don't particularly like the letter h for this because we've also used it for history, but it's the letter that's used in Sutton and Barto, so I wanted to be consistent with that. This just means preference. It doesn't mean value. These h's don't necessarily have to correspond or converge to the value of selecting that action. It's just a number that tells you this is how much you prefer this action to the other. So we've now parameterized the policy by just assigning a number to each of the actions and then defining a policy like this. This is a stochastic policy. This means that the probability of selecting a certain action is between zero and one. If the preference of one action is much, much higher than for all the other actions, the probability for selecting that action then in the limit goes to one and the probability of selecting the others goes to zero. But we're going to view these preferences basically as learnable parameters, and then we're going to reason about how can we optimize them. Yes? Are the preferences still like relative to each other, the same as values relative to each other? No. I think it's not up to the constant. No. Um, so the question was whether these preferences are, whether they have the same re relative relationship to each other as values would have? And the answer is no. For instance, one, one way to, to think about that is you might you might know that a certain action needs to be the optimal action. There's multiple ways to do that here, but the only thing you need is that the preference for that action is much, much higher than for all the other ones. And especially all the other preferences, the relative ordering doesn't even have to be the same as for the values. All that we need is that their preferences are much lower than for this one other action. So even the, like, even the ordering of the preferences might be different. This would be slightly wrong, but if one action like completely dominates because the preference is much, much higher, it wouldn't actually show up in your policy, and the policy doesn't care. One other thing to maybe note is that you can actually add anything to these preferences, in this case, and it would disappear from the probability. You can, you can shift them up and down, and it would disappear from the probability. It's fairly easy to show that, I won't show it here, but it, it again shows that these things don't have the semantics of a value function. Yeah. Sorry? What? what influences the preferences apart from the values? So do you mean how can we learn the preferences or how, what do they mean? What influences uh, which action you prefer is not just the value? Oh, so, so what influences the preference of an action if it's not the value? So I'm going to show you an algorithm that updates these preferences directly. And basically what I'm saying here is that it will not be equivalent to learning the values. These preferences won't go necessarily to the values. We won't even learn the values. But what we will do is we're going to update these preferences so that the resulting policy will attain higher value. So in some sense, the values still influences, influence these preferences in the sense that we're going to sample rewards, and these rewards will be high or low, and the preferences for certain actions might go up or down depending on the rewards. So definitely the rewards still influence your, uh, uh, your preferences. And the true value still influences your preference in the sense that, for instance, eventually we want the preference for the optimal action, which is the action with the highest value, to also become the highest preference. But there's no direct tie in the sense that we can write down these preferences as a simple function of the value. It also depends on the algorithm that you run to update these preferences. Here I'm just parameterizing, right? I haven't yet given you an algorithm to update these preferences. I'm just saying this is one way you could write down a policy, a parametric policy. This is one way to parameterize that, where we just parameterize it through these preferences. And then the question is, this is basically a concrete instantiation of a parametric policy. The question is, how can we learn these things in general? And for this one specifically, I'll talk about both. But first I'll talk about the general idea. So the idea is to update the policy preference, uh, sorry, the policy parameters, which might for instance be those preferences, so that the expected value increases. For instance, we can consider gradient descent because we have a lot of knowledge about how to do gradient descent on things. This seems like a, a, a valid and good algorithm to try. And what we then essentially want to do, we want to do gradient ascent on the expected value. We're doing ascent rather than descent because we're not reducing a loss, we're increasing a value. So in the bandit case, this is the algorithm that we want. We have some policy parameters, which I've now called theta, 
Just think of this as a vector, which for instance might just be all your action preferences in the case that we discussed before. But I'm talking about a slightly more general case here. Then we're going to add something to these uh, parameters, which is a step size times the gradient of the expected reward conditioned on those parameters. Now, I didn't put that here, but these parameters, of course, somehow influence your policy, and the previous slide gave you a concrete example of that. But here I just wrote it down in a, in a generic way where we basically say this expectation of the reward is conditioned on these policy parameters because these policy parameters define your policy and therefore the expectation changes if you change these parameters. So theta are the policy parameters that we're go going to want to update. But now the question only becomes how can we compute this gradient or is it even possible? Because we now have a gradient of an expectation but we don't know the expectation. We don't have that in general. So now here's an important trick and I'll show it again in a later lecture as well but I'll show it here for the bandit case, which is sometimes called the log likelihood trick. And in reinforcement learning, it's sometimes also known as the reinforced trick because uh, Ron Williams had a paper that, it, that, that used this to do policy gradients. Um, and I'll step through this because it's kind of, it's, it's kind of cool for one and it's, it's important also to understand what's happening. So what I'm doing here is I take that thing that we want that's all the way there at the left, top left. It's the gradient with respect to the expectation of the reward. And I'm just going to write this out. First thing I do, I'll be explicit about the policy. Why is this an expectation? Well, it's an expectation because of two reasons. We have a stochastic policy, and then this will give us an action. And then given that action, the reward itself might be stochastic. So first we'll pull out the action. And we're basically writing down the policy there, which says, okay, there's a probability of selecting this action, and then what remains is the probability of the reward conditioned on that action. Now note that this no longer depends on your policy parameters anymore because we've pulled out all the dependency of the policy parameters by being explicit about the probability of selecting the action. Also note that this thing, the expected reward conditioned on an action, is just the true action value. So we can write that down as Q. This is just plugging in that definition, essentially. Another thing that we've done here is pull inside the gradient signal, the nabla, the nabla, because Q, as I said, doesn't depend on your policy. This is already conditioned on your action, so if you know your action, the expected reward no longer depends on your policy. Because we're doing the bandit case, there's no sequential structure, right? We're just saying, for this action, this is the expected reward. Now on the next line, we're doing something a little bit weird. We're multiplying with one, essentially. We're multiplying with the probability of the action divided by the probability of the action. Of course this is valid because this is one. But we're doing this because we can then rewrite. And the way we'll rewrite is we'll pull the probability of selecting the action all the way in front again. And the reason to do this is because then this sum becomes an expectation again. So what I've done, I've pulled the division out and I put it near uh, the gradient of this policy and I pulled uh, the probability of the action all the way to the front, which then means by definition we can write it again as the expectation there at the bottom. One other thing I did down there, which you can, you, I could have just kept Q there, because the expectation of the reward, this expectation is over everything again, this expectation of the reward, um, sorry, I should have conditioned this on theta, by the way. This is now an expectation depending on your policy parameters. But the expectation of the reward is the same as the expectation of the true value, by definition. So I wrote the reward again rather than the true value. And otherwise, we get rid of this uh, policy probability at the beginning because this is now defined, defined in the expectation where it's the expectation over your policy. And the other part remains. So the, the part that remains is the gradient of your policy divided by the probability of selecting that action. Now it turns out, and this is the final line here, you can write down that this is a general truth. The gradient of something, like the derivative of something divided by that something itself is the same as the derivative of the logarithm of that something. That's just by definition, the gradient of the logarithm is, uh, so if you have uh, log x, say, you take the derivative with respect to x, this is one over x. And therefore, this is uh, an equality there at the end. And people typically write it down 
this way with the gradient of the log probabilities. Um, Rich, in his book, prefers the other way, where he keeps these explicit division by policy. But these are the same. So why are we going through these hoops? Why are we doing this? Does anybody have an idea? Yeah. Now we can sample. Exactly. Now we have an expectation on the outside. Very good. So now we can sample this thing. We couldn't sample before because the expectation wasn't all the way at the outside. We had a gradient of an expectation. And sampling the thing inside, that doesn't even make sense. We could sample the reward, but what is the gradient of the policy parameters with respect to the reward? That's not a thing. The reward is just a scalar. So that didn't make sense. But now that we're all the way at the end, we have an expectation around something. So we can just sample that thing inside. And this will be an unbiased estimate for the thing we all the way, all, had all the way at the beginning. So this is pretty cool. Now we can get an unbiased sample for the gradient of the value. So this is just summarizing the result that we had on the previous slide. The gradient of the expected reward is equal to the expectation of the reward times the gradient of the log probability of selecting the action. And we can then sample this, turn it into an algorithm. So the gradient descent algorithm simply becomes this, where we update the policy parameters using step size times the sampled reward times the gradient with respect to the policy parameters of the log um, probability of selecting the action that you did. It's important that this is the action that you actually took because the reward is for that action. Right? You sampled a certain reward for that action. And this is now stochastic gradient ascent on the true value of the policy. I was talking about gradient ascent first. This is the stochastic version thereof. And we know in practice we often do stochastic gradient descent. And this works just fine in a sense. You just have to make sure that your steps don't, aren't too big. And in the end you'll find uh, something where this gradient is zero, hopefully. And in simple cases, if your function is convex, say, or in, in this case we're doing ascent or concave, then you'll find uh, an optimum. In general, you might not find an optimum. You might get stuck somewhere in a suboptimum. But still, this is the nature of gradient descent and ascent. So that can't really be uh, uh, prevented. But you get all the benefits of uh, gradient descent. And particularly, I'm going to come back to that later. What's nice about this is that your policy can now be an, uh, a very complex thing. It can be a deep network. Because we know how to do gradients on deep networks. And that's something that you couldn't get with all the more involved algorithms we've covered before. Note that we don't need a value function estimate. We can just use the sampled rewards. So we don't have necessarily have an explicit notion of value. We just have a parametric policy. Now we can, we can instantiate that to make it maybe a little bit more clear. Let's go back to the case where we have a specific policy, namely one that is parameterized with these preferences. And then we can t look at this algorithm and see what it looks like. Now, turns out for the softmax, and I encourage you to, deri to derive this yourself. I think Rich also has a der derivation in the book. Um, it turns out it'll look like this. The partial derivative of the uh, log probability of selecting an action with respect to the preference of a potentially different action, note A, T, and A, these are not necessarily the same, it'll turn out that this thing becomes the indicator whether A is A T minus the probability of selecting that action A. Now this is a little bit opaque, I find, so I find it much clearer if I write it out like this at the bottom. Essentially what it means is that you, you've selected a certain action, and what you'll do is you'll update all the preferences, interestingly. This is because your policy is just parameterized with these preferences, and one way to make this action, for instance, let's say you want to make this action more likely. There's two ways to do that. You could either increase the preference for this action, or you could decrease the preference for all the other actions. Turns out, in general, the algorithm does a little bit of both. It pushes down the other actions, and it pushes up this action. This, again, shows that these preferences are values. You've learned nothing about the value of the other actions. But you can learn that you prefer them a little bit more or a little bit less. And it turns out the way it works is that you're going to update your preference depending on the reward. 
So let's consider a simple case. Let's say your rewards are either plus one or minus one. You've selected a certain action. Let's say the reward was plus one. What will happen here is the preference for that action will increase. And it will increase proportional to how big, so basically one minus how likely you were to select that action. If you were already going to select that action with probability pretty much one, there will be little change to your preference. It was a good idea, you had a reward of plus one, but you're already selecting it all the time, you won't change it much. Um, if your, your, your prob probability of selected that action was very low, you might make a bigger adjustment to your preference. Because you saw something good, it wasn't likely that you were going to select this action, but there's something good emerged, so you're going to update it quite a bit. The other preferences, if you get a reward of plus one, they basically go down. That, again, the rewards here are plus one or minus one, so if you select something and it was a good idea, you might want to select the other ones a little bit less. If conversely the reward was minus one, then the preference for the action you selected will go down, and the uh, preference for the actions you didn't select will go up. In total, this will mean that you're going to select actions that were a good idea more often, and actions that were a bad idea less often. This gives you a nice intuitive algorithm, but remember, this is just derived, right? We, we've parameterized the, the, the policy in a certain way, but we're just doing gradient descent on the value. There's an intuitive algorithm here that tells you, oh, you shift your preferences this way or that way, depending on the outcome. But it was just what emerged from doing the derivation of the algorithm. There are slightly less intuitive cases. For instance, if all of your rewards are strictly positive, what this will do is it will always push up the preference of the action you've selected by nature of the update. However, it will push up the actions of, uh, the preferences of the actions that you've, um, sorry, the actions with a high value, it will push up more than the, the preference of the actions with a low value. And then in total, it again will come to the conclusion that it will only select in the end the action with the highest value, even though it pushes all the preferences up. So sometimes it's a little bit less intuitive, but it's still the same, uh, same result in the end. It just shifts your preferences. Okay. Is this clear? Yeah. Is this back to what you were saying before, sort of the theoretical motivation for if you're sampling from a deep network and you're passing through your and that and you sort of represent the last layer as representing your preference set, that now you can as you're doing your learning, that's how gradient really descent works, you're going to be preferring some yeah. and just preferring others. Yes, yeah, so if I paraphrase, correct me if I'm wrong. So yeah. the way you would implement this, if you have, say, uh, you want to solve a very hard problem, so maybe there's pixels coming at you, it's hard to say what is actually uh, need, needed to be captured about this problem, so what we want to use is a deep neural network and just learn the structure. And then one way to set it up is that the input is just your pixels, you go through several layers, and at the output you have a vector, the semantics of this vector is then the preference for each of the actions. And then you can use exactly this algorithm to learn these preferences. The gradient will flow all the way into the network because right now we're, we're parameterizing with these preferences themselves, but the general statement with this, like the full weight vector of your neural network, all of the weights of your neural network, you can update all of them, right? Uh, so you can just push your gradient into your network with backprop, update all the parameters appropriately, and it will slowly change these preferences to go towards higher rewards. That's exactly what happens. And this is not just a theoretical possibility, this is what's actually used a lot in practice. Yeah? Using that formulation, uh, how would you deal with continuous action spaces without discretizing the space? That's a very good question. So how would you deal with continuous action spaces? Well, um, the action preference version maybe doesn't apply as uh, easily. You can still define action preferences, but you'd have to somehow define a probability space. This is perfectly possible, and you can. Um, but this thing also applies more generally, in a sense. Um, so one thing you could do to give, give, give two, two concrete examples that I'll also get back to later in the course. One is you could just define a Gaussian probability distribution, which is still a stochastic policy, which is still parametric, and you could do exactly the same trick. 
your gradients will look different, right? The, the, this, this slide specifically is specific to the softmax preference version, but we just need your policy to be um, some stochastic policy that has a well-defined log pi for each action, which it will because it's a probability distribution. Um, and then you could also apply this to say Gaussian uh, actions in maybe a high dimensional space. The other thing you can do is you could do something similar but different when you have a deterministic policy that just suggests one continuous action. I won't explain exactly how that works, but you can do that and there's also algorithms that can use gradients to update those. It's a good question, thanks. So a physical analogy for that might be learning to balance a double pendulum or something like that. Yeah, and actually this has been applied to balancing pendulum, uh, things like that. Um, for those you typically need continuous actions, you can do this with discretizing your action space and then use something like this. But that doesn't make a lot of sense in some cases because you, what you essentially want when you want to use continuous actions, you want to also generalize across the action space. And this turns out to be very useful. But I'll talk about continuous actions later in the course more. Um, we're almost running out of time, so I'll quickly this is still important to cover. Note that the sum of the probabilities is always one, or the integral of its continuous actions. What this means is that you can consider any B, which does not depend on the action, and does not depend on your policy parameters, and then the sum of B times the gradient of the, of the, of the policy will be zero. This is kind of a trivial proof, just takes a couple of steps, because we basically pull out that sum of probabilities, which is guaranteed to be one, therefore the gradient cannot move this sum, so the gradient must be zero. But what this means is important, because what it means is we can actually add a baseline to the reward. Now one way to think about this baseline is the expected value across actions. That's a common choice, actually. Uh, Rich, in chapter two, he'll, he'll propose to just use the average reward over all that you've seen so far as a baseline. Now what is the purpose of this baseline? It doesn't change the expectation because of this three line proof over here. So the expected update is still gradient ascent on your value, but what it does do, it reduces the variance potentially. So instead of updating your preferences, let's go to the case where all your rewards are strictly positive. Instead of always updating your preferences up, which would be otherwise the case, what this algorithm will do, it'll move them up if they're better than expected and it'll move them down if they're worse than expected, where expected is now defined by this baseline. This baseline is just something you, you, you estimate, and it doesn't necessarily have to be that accurate, because you're just using it to, to reduce the variance of your update, so it doesn't have to be the true value of your, for your policy. Um, and this figure shows, this is from chapter two, so feel free to like look at it in more detail there. This shows the effect that it can have on the performance. With a baseline, it's much better than without the baseline for this specific setup. The details of the setup are in chapter two. They're not on the slides, so, uh, okay. So, um, I think we need to vacate the room. So the one thing I wanted to say before we leave is to, you can go to the slides, there's like a small back to the example. I hope I calculated these correctly, but they give the, uh, the rat the probabilities for each of these algorithms. And I'll see you next Tuesday.